Welcome to worship at Atwood Presbyterian on October 24th. The month of October is disappearing quickly, and I'm so glad you're able to join us today and, and worship, and hopefully we have a message. Uh, we can find something in our message today from the Bible, hear what God is speaking to us on this day and, and in our time. And, uh, you know, welcome, and I hope you've had a great week, and uh, hopefully you're looking forward to another great week this coming week. Um, a few announcements before we get started. Um, we're doing a, a Christmas photo um, shoot. And so the premise of this is we have a, a backyard decorated up and it's got an outdoor fireplace. There'll be Christmas trees, there'll be greenery trees. And uh, the idea is you bring your photographer and you take your Christmas pictures in front of the, the, the backdrop. And uh, so you, uh, there's some information on the, the church's Facebook page, or you can give me a call, and uh, you contact Deb, um, Deb to um, book your appointment. There are half-hour slots, and each half-hour is thirty dollars. And so um, we're going to go to the effort and make this decorating up for you, and um, make it easy for you to get your Christmas pictures. And, and it's a little bit of a fundraiser for the church too, just to help maintain our, our ministry in the, the community of Atwood. So yeah. So anyways, if you um, it's coming up fast. I can't remember the dates. So it seems kind of bad to me, doesn't it? But I just believe it's the first week of November. And uh, you know, just uh, be sure you get that booked, or you're going to be disappointed. Uh, the other thing that I'm not sure I've told you before, but I uh, made a grant application to get some live streaming equipment for the church, and uh, we actually got that grant equipment, and our techie guy has been busy um, looking at equipment and buying equipment, and um, is starting to be gathered together. And I'm hoping within the next month that maybe we can start doing that and we can actually live stream the church service to you instead of doing it through this format. Um, I'm not complaining, but this format does take time. Um, by the time I edit it and do all that stuff in the background, um, do this church service, um, you know, it's cuts into other things I could be doing. So, um, so that's another thing kind of exciting happening. And I had one other thing, and I forgot it already. Isn't that horrible? Um, hmm. I'll have to come back to that. I forgot. <laughs> Anybody ever had that problem in life? Oh, well. well let's uh, dive into our church service. Our call to worship. Praise the Lord in every time and place. We all speak God's praises constantly. Boast only in the Lord. We all praise God's wonderful deeds. Spread the news of God's greatness. We all give God's glory everywhere we go. So let's worship God together this day. I'm just going to... Ooh. Anyways, um, a little bit more background lighting there. A little dark in here. Well, this, uh, this is a kind of a disjointed opening, isn't it? I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. O oh Lord our God, you hear the voice of those who cry out to you and you respond with love. You reach out to us when others have turned away. You offer us compassion when others dismiss our worth. You heal us when we thought we were beyond repair. Your amazing love transforms our lives over and over again. And so we offer you our humble praise. In the name of Jesus, your love made flesh, receive our gratitude in this time of worship as we join you and your whole creation to bring you honor and glory now and always. Amen. So I have um, one scripture, focus scripture lesson today. And again, we're in lecture readings and uh, we're nearing the end of Job. So we've been um, four weeks in Job, whole month. And... Uh, so this is the end of Job, and uh, if you have been following along, um, Satan has challenged God that if Job uh, has something bad happen to him, he'll turn away from God, and uh, so anyways, Job goes through a trial, um, he's, he loses his family, he loses his wealth, and yet he still um, maintains God as sovereign. And then his health leaves him. 
Then he has a bunch of friends give some unhelpful advice. And uh, towards uh, the end, um, Job is quite angry at God. He wants to put God on trial. Trouble is he can't find God. And then last week, God finally shows up and explains to Job in a way that really isn't very well done. Well, it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of a strange way of saying it. Um, he doesn't actually answer Job's questions. He just makes the point that Job really doesn't understand God's world and how God works. He, he cannot possibly know how God works. And so we actually enter the end here. And um, so let's hear what uh, the word of the Lord here. Um, there's a powerful message in this. And we'll get into that in the sermon. So Job 42, and I'm reading from the NIV version. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. And you said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears have heard you. And now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And we'll go down to verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who knew him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon them, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. And he also had seven, daughters, or th- seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jeremiah, Jemimah, the second, Keziah, and the third, Karina Hapat Posh. Nowhere in all the land were found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their children to the fourth generation, and so he died, old and full of years. Amen. Glory to God. The reading his holy word. bring up our sermon. You like once upon a time stories? Once upon a time. A group of university friends. You know, they graduated from university. They got their jobs, their dream jobs. They, they established themselves in their careers. And, and, you know, they got together to visit their old university professor. Conversations soon, soon turned into complaints about stress and life and work, the problems they were having. You know that grumbling that happens we're not really truly happy in life. And so the wise professor listened and offered his guests coffee. The professor went to the kitchen and returned with a, a pot of coffee and an assortment of cups. There were porcelain cups, plastic cups, glass, crystal, Some very plain looking, some expensive, some beautiful, exquisite pieces of works of art. And he told them to help themselves to the coffee. When all the students had a a coffee cup in hand, the professor said, if you noticed, all the nice looking expensive cups were taken up, leaving behind the plain and the cheap ones. Well, it is but normal for you to want only the best for yourselves, That is the source of your problems and distress. The cup itself doesn't add to the quality of the coffee, and in some cases even hides and masks what we drink, and yet you consciously went for the best looking cups. Then they began looking around. They began eyeing each other's cups. With compassion, the professor said, life is like coffee. The jobs, the money, the position in society are the cups. They are just tools to hold and contain life. And the type of cup we have does not define nor change the quality of life we live. While you pursue those fine cups, 
be sure to keep focus on enjoying the coffee. When I started that once upon a time, you knew there was going to be a good ending. A moral lesson that will leave you us feeling good and you know, teach us something, how to reevaluate our lives. And this coffee cup story it does have a good ending. The professor is pointing to the truth that the coffee is life, is what we really need to seek, the joy we have. And I firmly believe what he's saying here is, is God and his grace at this point in time. A God who provides us with the beauty and the bounty of this wonderful world. A God who is always with us, even though we try and hide in those fancy cups we hold in life hide from God in a pursuit of happiness. When the happiness we so desire is actually God's love that is around us. And you know, it's free for the taking. It's offered up with no strings attached. When we read Job, we have the advantage of observing Job from above the story. And we can see the beginning and the end. And I think this story of Job relates back to these coffee stories cup story but you know when we look at the story from the beginning to the end Job does not have the advantage that we have that we can see the beginning and the end and we actually know what's going to come next with Jesus and his death on the cross the resurrection Job didn't have that advantage and Job as I just said, doesn't have the advantage of viewing the world through the teachings of Jesus. Job would never have known how the story would end. Yet we do. The book of Job is, is really a story for us. It's a story about us. And as we move through Job, we know the story will end nicely. That the world of Job will be fixed and he lives happily ever after like a, a nice Disney cartoon. Don't you just love those Disney movies? The evil prince gets what he deserves and, and the downtrodden or the damsel of distress, they, they live happily ever after. Job discovers that the idea we are rewarded for good behavior and punished for bad behavior is not God's way. Yes, bad things happen to good people. God has nothing to do with that. You know, there is a mystery in God that we as humans do not fully grasp. Job's trying. We're trying. We see glimpses of it. However, our scriptures clearly reveal that God is working to restore and reconcile us back to him. God fixes everything. However, if we study the text before us this morning closely, we find a few problems with the idea that God fixes everything. The story's not tied up with a nice bow or the ribbon on top. Job's life is not as good after his suffering and questioning as we might believe. The last chapter of the text is that Job lived for another 140 years, but there's no mention that he lived happily ever after. On the surface, yes, it does look like he did. Yes, Job had more children, but we all know we continue to grieve those we have lost. Memories of dead children will continue to haunt Job. What about those brothers and sisters and friends of Job? They, for the most part, except for three or four of them, had left Job, ignored him. And the few friends that stayed were not all that helpful in Job's grief. Yet in our scripture, they show up again. And this is the final chapter, as if nothing ever happened. How would Job feel about this? How would you feel about that? I remember a personal story in grade nine in high school. We were new to the high school, making new friends and relationships. I remember one friend from public school who had drifted away. This happens when you have new friends. And... But I did feel a little hurt that our friendship was not what it had been. A few months later, he started hanging around again. Great, my old friend was back. And then he started asking about this female friend I had. Could I introduce him to her? Well, it was clear he was using me. He wasn't so much interested in my friendship as he was in that other person who had caught his eye. What would Job think about his family, 
friends, coming back after they had in essence shunned him. Maybe that silver and gold they gave Job was a feeling of guilt. And it was given from a feeling of guilt and not really true reconciliation. And then the blessing from God of all those animals and the wealth. Think about what that might imply. Is that really a blessing? You think about it. How figure out how to feed and water all those animals? How many people would Job need to hire to care and water and feed those animals? How many headaches would Job have in organizing all this? The truth of having money and, and farming in particular is it comes with great responsibility. Responsibility to others, to the animals, to the family, to the workers. There would be headaches and stress involved. And then as I was researching this, I discovered that scholars actually believe that that epilogue we're talking about, the last chapter, is thought to have been added later. All the restoration of Job was added later because the original readers of the story did not like the ending. The ending that we read. It ends where Job is sitting on a pile of dust and ashes. How often have you watched a movie? Did not like the ending. Have a feeling of being kind of let down. Wish they would rewrite the story in a better way. Because the story that we hear does not match the ending that we want. There are many reasons to believe the ending was added later from the language to the sentence structure and you know all these things that scholars do. But the biggest thing it seems to is that it refutes all the theological arguments that Job has discovered. He discovered he's a finite creature, has no wisdom to run this world, has no business inter instructing his maker and ruler how to run the world, and more importantly, condemning God for the way he runs it. Job discovers that just because you do everything right doesn't mean God will reward you with riches, that you're blessed for being good. But that epilogue, that final bit, refutes everything that Job has discovered about God. Job's restoration is the exact opposite of the warning message of the book of Job. So the story ends with Job still sitting in a pile of dust and ashes and being critical of himself, asking for repentance. That is not the fairy tale ending we so much want to hear. So the authors decide just to tweak the story, make it a, a happy one. How often have we felt like that, that we're sitting in dust and ashes? Our life has been turned upside down because medical diagnosis, unexpected death, job loss, financial worry, unexpected expenses. But I would challenge this thought the original ending of Job ends with no hope. The ending of dust and ashes is actually one full of hope. Why would I say that? Well, through the book of Job, and it, it's kind of easy to miss because we're focused on the one thing, but there's actually something else going on. You see, there's two parallel streams of teaching and revelation flowing through it side by side. There's this undeserved suffering that we've been focusing on. This undeserved suffering but then on a parallel stream is this undeserved grace from God that's flowing as well. You notice we focus on the pain and the suffering through the scripture, but we miss the other stream, the undeserved grace that God gives us. A strange way, grace is revealed as Job is sitting in that dust and ashes. Dust and ashes, that, that's a metaphor we use for funerals, dirt to dirt, Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Symbols of death, human symbolisms. But we miss the life and the salvation that God is providing. The undeserved grace that we receive. The dust and the ashes we sit in is in contrary, in contradiction to what God wants for us. Job is our story. And God's patience in God's revelation to Job, we find that God understands our suffering, forgives and restores us. 
God's love for us forms our salvation we need from death. And I mentioned earlier, we are so lucky to read Job through the lens of Jesus Christ's resurrection from the cross. It all makes sense when you see it from that point of view. But Job discovers there's no salvation in his possessions, no salvation found in his friends and his family. It wasn't until everything was stripped away and Job was left with nothing to Job discover his salvation was found in God. What we need is not stuff. What we need is not stuff for our salvation, but a relationship with God. Our Lord's salvation is there even when the memory of death haunts us. Dust and ashes. Salvation is there in spite of the loss and pain of life that we feel. Dust and ashes. The end of the book of Job tells us when the dark night is over, the sun always rises with God. There's always the promise of restoration and hope. Verse 17. Job dies. Did you read that? It doesn't say that Job died in joy. But we do know that Job died in God's grace and salvation. The question for us is, can we live life knowing that life is not always perfect we will have those times of sitting in the dust and the ashes. And if Job's story is our story, can we release to God our sin and pain? The answer is yes, because God is always ready to hear and to respond and to save us. Salvation is free and available to us. Jesus came to earth, died on the cross to restore us to wholeness, to gather up the broken pieces of our life and create something beautiful. That is what God does. He restores the things that are broken. He wants to restore us to wholeness. Got another story. I guess you could call this a once upon a time story. There's a story about an Anglican church in Meaford. Meaford's not very far from here. During World War II, their minister, and his name was Harold Appleyard, it's quite an interesting name, but he wanted to join the fight. So he joined the fight as a chaplain. And on Sunday, March 22, 1942, he preached his farewell sermon before leaving to join the Canadian chaplain service. Well, Harold got to England. And the destruction in England struck him as appalling nearly as soon as he landed. He was witnessing all those bombed buildings, shattered windows, damaged churches, buildings. And he quickly began to collect shards of the beautiful stained glass from the shattered windows of the damaged churches. And as he gathered up those pieces, he soon had an idea. He had a vision. How about using them for a memorial window at his parish church back in Meaford? That vision became reality as that broken glass from 125 different churches and cathedrals was shipped back to Meaford. The company gave them new life creating beautiful Gothic windows at Meaford. It's like God in our world. Those times when our lives feel shattered, we do have a happy ending. God does restore us. We may not be exactly the same as we were before. We'll have those cracks and we'll have different impacts in our lives that create different broken pieces, but God brings them back together and restores us to wholeness. All glory to God. Amen. Now let's turn to our prayers. We had um, a story this week where we had uh, a person that was 
Uh, medical condition was very serious. He was to go see a, a surgeon, and uh, we had been praying for her in church. Uh, we don't say names, but it was part of my prayers. And uh, and this comes into is it a coincidence or did this actually happen? But she um, went to see her surgeon. He looked at her and says, "You're good." He was amazed. You can go home. There's no need for surgery anymore. And this is a woman that had been you know, laid up for close to a month. And uh, so anyways, yeah, it's just one of those things. Was that a prayer answered or was this just normal? I'd like to think it's a prayer answered. And uh, again, one of those mysteries of God that, you know, and I thought it was kind of a story about how he does restore us back and uh, in his way. So let's lift up our prayers. And I'm sure we all have people we want to pray for. And uh, we'll leave a little bit of silence in there to let those names that are on your heart. God of life, you open our eyes in the world you love and show us your presence and purpose all around us. We see the beauty and the wonder of your creation in autumn changes and in gifts of love and compassion offered through friend and stranger. For those and these many gifts, we give you thanks. And we pray for those who cannot recognize those gifts in their lives and find themselves lost and alone. Don't recognize the gift of God, your amazing grace. Open their eyes to your presence through our companionship and our eyes for opportunities to reach out with understanding. God of justice, open our eyes on the world and show us struggle and conflict. We see the stressful times in which we live and the burdens many are carrying. And today we pray for those whose businesses are struggling as the pandemic stretches on. For producers unsure their harvests will be sufficient this season. For workers uncertain about their jobs or looking for new work. And for families carrying out the stress of economic uncertainty. Open our eyes for new possibilities. Open our eyes to ways so we can support them. God of wisdom, you open our eyes on the world and show us its complexities. Much in the same way you open Job's eyes. We see countries locked in old animosities, communities overwhelmed by anger, upheaval. And we pray for millions displaced by current conflicts and natural disasters and for leaders everywhere trying to find solutions to complex problems. Dear Lord, open our eyes to those around us. They're hurting. Those around us in need of medical help. Those who are seeking medical help and waiting diagnosis. Dear Lord, we raise those names before you in a moment of silence. Dear Lord, open the eyes of those who lead us to recognize the suffering among the people and open our ways that we can participate in solutions. God of hope, we offer you our prayers, longing for your peace and promise to break into the lives we care about for the sake of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we come to the end of a, another church service, and uh, hopefully we had a message of hope for you in there. And I'm hoping and praying that you'll have a wonderful week ahead of you. Go with the blessing of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace from this day forward and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week.